Hi, my name is Clinton Erling, and I'm the president of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry. The Chamber's Business Review is an informative weekly television magazine of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry. We will showcase the activities of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry, feature interviews of prominent business personalities, and broadcast our popular training seminars for the entire country's benefit. So please sit back and enjoy while we indulge your attention over the next half an hour. I'm Kit Nascimento and I'm your interviewer for today's program. And for today's program, we have Dr. Ashni Singh, the Minister of Finance. So, Minister, welcome. Thank you very much, Kit. Minister, there are probably two issues right now of great public concern and attention. I don't imagine I'll surprise you when I name them. The first, the failure so far to pass the anti-money money laundering and countering the financing of a terrorism bill. It's a big, it's a big term. Uh, and moving on later, the Chief Justice is ruling that the National Assembly acted unlawfully and unconstitutionally by imposing uh, reductions to the budget estimates uh, and allowing that to happen last year. But let's deal first of all with the, uh, the money laundering bill. The whole nation seems to be in travail at the moment over, over the inability of, uh, let's put it this way, the inability of the government to persuade the opposition that this is a good bill and that they should support it. Uh, it was actually introduced uh, on December the 12th. It was laid before Parliament, I think, I think then. And um, then it went into a select committee uh, on, the, on the 19th. And since then, the nation has been reading reports of one type or another describing what appears to be a complete clash of minds between the government and uh, the opposition parties on, on, on this bill. What we do know uh, is that the Financial Action Task Force uh, is meeting in Paris at the moment. Uh -huh. uh, uh, I think tomorrow is a probable deadline for Guyana uh, indicating that this legislation has been, has been passed to the satisfaction of CFAT, which is the Caribbean Action Task Force. And uh, there is a very real possibility, as I understand it, that uh, unless we submit the fact that this legislation has now been passed to their satisfaction, um, then the FATF, as, as, as we call it, will more than likely report this to the International Cooperation Review Group. Uh, in other words, Guyana is going to be very seriously blacklisted internationally. So let me ask you this. Where do we stand right now? Okay. Well, first of all, Kit, let me thank you very much for inviting me to appear uh, on this program. And let me say at the onset that I agree with you entirely on your identification of two uh, topical issues that have certainly been the subject of considerable public debate. On the first one uh, that you've identified and that you specifically ask about, you are absolutely right that the entire nation has been transfixed with the unfolding events surrounding this bill. And many persons who had never heard about acronyms like FATF and CFATF and AML, CFT now you are becoming these, familiar with them. Th this has become uh, this, uh, this, these abbreviations and acronyms and, and the terminology have become um, entrenched now almost in common uh, parlance and, and, and casual conversation. Um, you ask about where we are right now, and I with your permission, I would like perhaps to go back a little bit before I... No, uh, please go back, because I think it would be very important sure. that the nation gets a, a real understanding 
uh, of what's going on and, and is able to put in some sure. sort, of, sort of understandable context. Sure. You mention the fact that the bill has been before the Parliament since December of 2013, and you're absolutely correct in this regard. But it's useful for your viewers to remind themselves that the original Money Laundering Act, which is described as the Principal Act, was in fact enacted by the Parliament of Guyana unanimously in 2009, having itself been unanimously approved by a bipartisan um, select committee. That bill at the time was tabled in 2007, spent a year and a half in select committee, and emerged with unanimous committee support, unanimous parliamentary support, and became the Anti-Money Laundering and Countering the Financing of Terrorism Act 2009. So it it, now that, that bill actually had the full support had of all of the political parties th that are currently in power. That is correct. It had full support, not abstentions. It had unanimous affirmative votes in its favor in 2009. And that's an important point for reasons that will become evident as we uh, review where we are. We subsequently were the subject of review by CFATF, who identified areas for further strengthening of that legislation, which became the recommendations. All right, tell me a little bit about that review. What, why were you reviewed? Well, all? countries are in fact reviewed cyclically. It's an automatic, it, it's an automatic thing that happens. Um, every member of CFATF, which is a regional body of FATF, the international body, is subject to review. It's, like I said, almost cyclical. You like all, all the Caribbean countries? All the Caribbean right. countries are members of CFATF, um, and each member comes up periodically for review as a matter of course. And essentially, this is part of the international architecture for ensuring that countries around the world have a common set of standards for fighting money laundering, including and in particular legislative standards. So there are standards that are applied, international standards that are applied in assessing every country's legislation. So when were we reviewed? We were reviewed, I believe, in 2011, it might have been. Mm -hmm. And a number of recommendations emerged, including administrative areas for strengthening, administrative and bureaucratic areas for strengthening, um, institutional arrangements to be modified, and most importantly, and for the greater part, legislative amendments to be enacted. Those legislative amendments were then captured in what became the Anti-Money Laundering and Counting the Financing of Terrorism Amendment Bill 2013, the predecessor to the current bill, which in fact went to Parliament in April of 2013. Okay, so you told me that uh, just now, I think, that CFAT first uh, contacted this, if I can put it in those terms, with regard to the need for these amendments. Yes, absolutely they would have identified areas for strengthening and made recommendations as to how these areas should be strengthened. We would have then contracted independent counsel to advise us on how these can be incorporated into a legislative draft. Now, that draft was in 2011? That was between 2011 and 2013. So initially, we would have had back and forth between CFATF and ourselves. So I have to ask you the question, why did that take so long? Well, like I said, this is, this is a, there's a process. and. First of all, one engages with CFATF to go through the recommendations. In many instances, there are explanations to be offered. There are alternative mechanisms that are in place that may not have been evident to the reviewers, etc. So having gone through that process, we eventually arrived at a set of recommendations that we agreed between ourselves and CFATF that we would proceed with and that would constitute satisfactory um, strengthening of our legislation. Was the opposition involved with in any of that? Not in the earlier stages, because we have first had to conclude a set of amendments that, that, that CFATF and, 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 and government agreed were necessary. We then contracted um, a private lawyer, um, very well-known prominent counsel in Guyana, to do the first draft. That draft was then subject to review by our domestic legislative drafters in the Attorney General's uh, chambers, and then subsequently subject to review by CFATF. Now, there seemed to be some misinformation about that. Did CFATF give the government a set of recommendations 
that then the government had to convert into legislative That's, that, 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 is, that, that is correct. Now, the result was this amendment bill that went to Parliament in, 2000, in, or in April of 2013, and that I, I will call that the predecessor bill to the current bill. That bill was referred to a select committee, as many of you now know, in early May 2013. Why did it go to a select committee? It in fact went to select... Why wasn't it just passed? Well, I will tell you this, that the government's preference would have been to pass it, and in fact we went to Parliament with the intention of passing it. It was referred to the select committee at the request and on a motion moved by a front bench opposition member who said at the time that while they supported, this is what was represented to the parliament at the time, they support the objective of strengthening anti-money laundering legislation, but that they would like an opportunity to scrutinize this bill in greater detail mm -hmm. and that the established mechanism for doing so is a parliamentary select committee. So a motion was moved by a front bench opposition member, who subsequently became a member of the committee, incidentally. And which government supported it? Which government supported. We had absolutely no difficulty with an opportunity for the opposition to scrutinize the bill in the ultimate degree of detail. So the bill went to a select committee in May, was in committee from May to November. Now tell us about that committee. How was it made up? The committee essentially comprised um, five members on the opposition side, four, mem four APNU and one AFC, four members on the government side, one of whom became eventually chair chairman. Yeah. This is uh, Gail Teixeira. Right. Uh, so it's five and four. Um, the committee comprised a number of front bench members. I mean, we devoted senior members of the cabinet to participate in the committee, recognizing the importance of the bill. So the attorney general, uh, the minister of finance, mm -hmm. And and myself, um, the Minister of Home Affairs initially and then subsequently the Minister within the Ministry of Finance and of course the chairperson was Gail Teixeira who was the presidential advisor. No, she government. was unanimously appointed she, by yes, the Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I mean in fact the opposition had a majority. She was elected chairman in this, by this right. opposition. And as chairman she doesn't government. have a vote, does she? She has a casting vote. As chairman she doesn't have an original vote. She has only a casting vote. Right. So you have five and three really of voting members in the committee. The committee met for a number of times, 17 occasions, I believe, and between... what exactly was the purpose of the committee? What was the objective? To scrutinize the bill in detail, to afford members on both sides of the House, nominated by their respective parties, an opportunity to acquaint themselves with the bill in any level of detail that they wish to acquaint themselves, to solicit and receive inputs from other stakeholders if the committee deemed necessary, mm -hmm. And with the benefit of this additional scrutiny and this additional input, to return to the House with either the bill in its original form and the recommendation that it be passed therein, or with recommendations that it be amended and then passed. That's the objective of the typical select committee, and the select committee was no different in that regard. Now that began on... May of 2013. Right. That committee met for 17 occasions between May and October. I, I will say that from the very inception, the government made it clear that we wanted the bill to be passed as soon as possible. And we made it very clear, as we have done consistently up to now, that we were available to meet as frequently as necessary for as long as necessary to secure its passage. When the select committee was appointed, there were some deadlines attached to a delivery of the bill, was it? Th that, that, that is correct. That is correct. And, and in these it, were deadlines set by CFAT? They were deadlines set by CFATF. Um, Just remind our listeners, CFAT is the Caribbean... That's the Caribbean right. Financial Action Task Force. So there was, in fact, um, initially a deadline. Um, in the first instance, the deadline was the end of May, a date towards the end of May. Mm -hmm coinciding with CFATF's plenary to be held in Managua in Panama. And so the plenary of CFATF at the end of May in Panama was going to assess Guyana again. And so we were in a situation where we needed to report back to CFATF that we had passed the bill by the end of May. Did you expect any difficulty? I must uh, confess that I didn't. I thought that particularly given the unanimity with which the principal act was passed, 
and especially given the uncontentious nature of the amendments within the bill currently before us. Because if I understand you correctly, this bill was actually structured to reflect the recommendations of CFAT itself. Absolutely, absolutely. And there's very little... It should have been easy going. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more, and I will say that, quite frankly, was my assessment, however naive now that assessment might appear to be. I didn't, by any stretch of the imagination, Im um, think that this bill would generate controversy. So what happened? Well, I suspect that what happened was that we discovered that the bill was not going to be considered solely on its merits by the opposition, and that, in fact, other considerations would be brought to bear. You mean other political considerations? Other political considerations. That had nothing to do with the bill? That had absolutely nothing to do with the bill. I will say this, with the benefit of our accumulated experience from April of last year to now, and you, you would know, of course, that eventually the bill was not passed in April. We then took it back again. It, it wasn't pa the, the bill that was submitted in April was not passed eventually in November. When that committee concluded its work, we took back the new bill, which incorporated the recommendations of the predecessor committee. And that bill, as you know, we are still to emerge from committee on because of issues that I'm going to speak about in a minute. But, no, but during that period, the nation was regaled with reports that one side or the other was not attending the meetings and therefore you couldn't proceed well, effectively. Well, I will say this, Kit, that in fact, the record is crystal clear on that. Mm. And there are verbatim transcripts of these meetings that are a matter of public record. And that's, pub pu that's public That's public knowledge. information. Verbatim transcripts of committee meetings are lodged in the parliamentary library for public consumption. The Events were clearly unfolding as follows from the very first days. The government members repeatedly, on every occasion, said we are available to meet tomorrow for as many hours as is necessary. The opposition members were invariably unavailable to meet, and not only on days in rapid succession, but for hours beyond the minimum number of hours. But what is more and particularly significant is that the government members were always of the position that were one or more of the government members not be able to attend, that that would not be an impediment to the committee proceeding. On some occasions, one or other government member could not attend, but we didn't on any occasion let that stand in the way of the convening of another meeting. On every occasion that a single member of the opposition was unable to attend, they insisted and used their majority to ensure that the committee not meet until all of their members could attend. And so that... Which was it, not necessary. Absolutely unnecessary. Absolutely unnecessary. Did they I, have a lead person? Well, they, they themselves had several prominent front bench um, members. I mean, I mentioned who the government members were. The opposition members were, I think, almost all front benchers. In the first committee, the opposition members were um, Basil Williams, Deborah Bakker, Carl Greenidge, um, Joseph Harmon mm -hmm. and Kamran Ramjatan, all front benches. And the only change since has been the replacement of Deborah Baker with uh, Jaipal Sharma. And all lawyers. And all lawyers. All lawyers. Therefore, qualified to do the job. Eminently qualified to. One would think. Uh, eminently qualified, you would think, to address their minds to this matter and to do so and dispose of it swiftly. And so the position was consistently taken that the committee cannot meet. If, the, if a single opposition member could not attend. And that itself, like I said, proved to be a huge impediment mm. to convening meetings in quick succession. As events unfolded, we proved unable to achieve the May deadline, as a result of which CFATF issued a public advisory drawing the world's attention to Guyana's non-enactment of the bill, urging Guyana to enact the bill by November of 2011, by the next plenary. That was in a public statement. So our country was actually put on notice. Our country, the world was put on notice. Uh, well, put on the, notice to the world. Ab absolutely. Um, the world was informed, the world at large was informed that Guyana was, on, was, uh, was a country that had not yet enacted legislation that had been recommended by this international regulatory body. 
And Guyana was put on notice that were we to fail to do so by the next plenary, that adverse consequences would flow. In fact, as a result of that advisory, some jurisdictions immediately issued advisory to their domestic financial systems, and informing them of Guyana's status within CFATF, and advising them to take additional precautions in executing transactions with Guyana. So in telling the story, perhaps we should just pause a little bit and describe the kind of consequences that would impact on the country. Well, I can tell you that as far back as me, immediately after the, C, the first CFATF advisory, like I said, a number of jurisdictions took action immediately. The, I mean, as a, a jurisdiction as close as Trinidad and Tobago, the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago published on their website and circulated to every regulated financial institution in Trinidad and Tobago an advisory saying Guyana was now identified by CFATF as potentially in default and that licensed financial institutions in Trinidad and Tobago should exercise due caution in doing transactions with, Trinidad, with, with, with Guyana. So in the very simplest of terms, this affects the nation negatively on how it does business internationally? Indeed. Well, I would say two things. First of all, it sends a signal to the international community. And it's a signal that goes to the core of a country's credibility and the integrity of its financial system. Right. So you have at the macro level an adverse signal being sent to the world at large. But you also have at the micro level individual companies doing business that found immediately and I know of real examples um, of companies that found immediately that transactions that had hitherto been routine transactions became complicated transactions. I'll give you one example. I was shown by a local company an email that they received from a company that they do business with on the other side of the world. And they said to me, we've been doing, and this is before November, this is shortly after May, this is sometime around June or so. They showed me an email and they said, we've been doing business with this company for 15 years. We've had absolutely no difficulty um, receiving payment for this company for services um, rendered. Um, we've had no difficulty sending money to this company for executing transactions on our behalf. Suddenly they were sent a long questionnaire, several pages, asking them all manner of things, identity of their directors, audited financial statements, a lengthy question. After 15 years of doing business with this company. Was this shared with you privately? This was shared with me. I asked you the question because I was going to ask you the follow-up one. Is, did, was this shared with the opposition? Well, it was shared with me privately. And I didn't, I didn't take the liberty of sharing the private business affairs of this company. Mm -hmm. Um, except that I urged them to make it known more widely. I said you should speak with the umbrella private sector bodies to which you belong and let them know that you're affected. Now the opposition... Uh, just, to give you just to give you another example, I, it, was all, it was immediately brought to my attention also by an insurance, a large insurance brokerage in Guyana, a very large, old, reputable insurance brokerage, that they too were receiving lengthy questionnaires for insurance renewals. Well, as you know, I sit on the Private Sector Commission Board, and I can endorse this, in fact. I'm well aware of what you're saying. Okay. Exactly. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad that they brought it to the attention of the Private Sector Commission, because that was my advice to them. I said, you need to tell your representative um, body that you are already being affected and that their advocacy has to be elevated. Indeed, I we were, we were at the board level, we were telling the, pub, uh, the uh, uh, members you need to make this public. You Good. need to let it be understood Excellent. that there are consequences uh, for delay. Excellent. Well, I'm glad that you did that, and that coincides very closely with what I did. I hadn't realized that you had advised them the same. But, and so as things unfolded, we didn't achieve the May deadline. We were then, after this advisory is, was issued, and we were told that we had, a November, we had the November plenary that we needed to achieve now, that was going to be held in um, the Bahamas. We then, and our assessment for that would have been done, I guess, about a month or so before. So we tried to work with the opposition to secure conclusion of the bill now before the parliamentary recess, which starts from around the 10th of August. They again proved to be unav unavailable, and we were unable to conclude 
the bill before the recess. In fact, it came to a point where we said we're willing to work through the parliamentary recess. And they were adamant and they used their majority to adjourn a meeting. I think it was a meeting towards the end of July or in the very early days of August. They adjourned the, meeting, the committee all the way to October using their majority. So we lost the period of the parliamentary recess during which the government said, we have absolutely no problem working through the recess. We'll all be here. Even if all of us are not here, we can continue working. Let me ask you this quickly because time sure. flies on television. Um, the opposition, did they show any uh, interest in amendments? Well, I'll tell you what. Because you, you, they, were, they were attending, even though they yeah. appear, from what you say, to have been delaying tactics. Uh, I, I will say this, that on several occasions, we asked for them to table any amendments that they were, would be interested in moving, on several occasions. In fact, I eventually, after we missed the May deadline and ended up in October, I made this call publicly. I said, if the opposition has difficulties with this bill and wishes to make specific recommendations, we would like to see what they are. We never saw any such recommendations. They never tabled um, any recommendations. So what was their stance when they did attend? Well, interestingly, and I'm going to go back to your opening remarks. In your opening remarks, you alluded to the, a clash of minds, I think. Mm. And I was going to say to you that, in fact, in striking contrast to the image that that phrase, a clash of minds, conjures, there was, in fact, a striking meeting of minds on the substantive clauses of the bill. In fact, throughout the deliberations of the committee, what was striking, and I have said that the verbatim transcripts of those meetings will prove to be a fascinating chronicle of how this entire matter has uh, evolved. Throughout the deliberations of the committee, there was never a difference between the two sides on the substantive clauses of the bill. So there was no substantial disagreement? No, no, absolutely not. The disagreements between the two sides were always when we will meet again and for how long. But not? Not, not on the substantive, substantive clauses. Discussion. Absolutely not. And I will say that on the substantive clauses of that bill and of the successor bill that went back to December and that has been before committee up to this last weekend and up to now, there has up to now not been a single material difference between the two sides on the matter of those substantive clauses, the substantive clauses of the bill. And there has not been a fundamental need to rewrite or amend any of those substantive clauses. In general, there's been broad agreement. There are minor presentational or technical amendments, a few small amendments here and there. But there has been no disagreement, no clash, no great variance on the matter of the bill before us. So pressed with deadlines, you brought it back to the House. Pressed with deadlines, we brought it back to the House. Well, in fact, having missed, what, uh, the, uh, the, there was a significant further development. Having missed the Nassau plenary, the Bahamas plenary, a second advisory was issued by, um, by, by CFATF, further cautioning Guyana and saying that the potential for review by FATF and the ICRG and so on were now looming. We then took back the bill to Parliament and with an appeal now, the opposition having had the benefit of by then I think about eight or nine months, we said we're bringing back the bill with the amendments that emerged from the, that first committee, we're bringing the bill back with an appeal that they sit with us, affording them even more time with a view to concluding that bill. But nine months now. of deliberations or absence of deliberations, you might put it, where there was no disagreement. Absolutely no disagreement. And no alternatives were offered either. No recommendations were made whatsoever. In fact, I will say this, kid, that bill having gone back to Parliament in December and a select committee having been um, elected um, from the 19th, and bill having been referred to a select committee from the 19th of uh, December, from then up to last Sunday, Mm -hmm. This new committee having been meeting, probably met six, seven times, and I, I, sh I, I hasten to add that 
in this new committee, the pattern of behavior was the same too. Government was available, the opposition was not. Government was willing to meet with an incomplete complement where that proved to be necessary. The opposition were adamant that they needed the full complement of their members to be present. Anyhow, even throughout the life of the second committee, up to last Sunday, we were not in the committee, nor was the nation afforded in writing what the opposition's proposed amendments were. At any time during all of this taking place, did the government side discuss with the opposition the consequences of this lack of progress? Absolutely. In to the country. In fact, we repeatedly reiterated, and I confess, deliberately so to ensure that it entered the record, mm -hmm. we repeatedly reiterated the grave national consequences that would flow from non-enactment, repeatedly. We did so in committee, and so it is in the parliamentary record, and we did so publicly. All right. I am speeding things up a bit sure. because I want to get the, sure. the most important facts out here. And I would like us to spend a little time on the Chief Justice's ruling. Sure. Um, it's been before the Select Committee. It's had further delaying tactics. Uh, there was still no disagreement on the details of the bill. But now, from what we hear, the government has the, been faced with uh, some amendments at the last minute. Well, in fact, we tell, were, tell us about those amendments. Well, in fact, we were presented with two sets of amendments by two APNU members. Significantly, those two sets of amendments had themselves not been coordinated. Between, so there was internal inconsistency between the two amendments. So they had not, up to Sunday night, they had clearly not sat down as a team and come up with a single set of amendments. That's and the first now, one. were these amendments to the bill, or did they reach beyond the Secondly, bill? None of these amendments were to the bill. They were all in relation to the principal act, which incidentally is not permitted by the standing orders of the parliament. The standing orders of the parliament, 95.3, standing order 95.3 to be precise, is clear. The sta standing order 95.3 says, a special select committee shall consider the matter and shall confine its con deliberations to the matter referred to it by the National Assembly. The National Assembly referred a bill to the Select Committee. So they were, the opposition, if I understand what you're telling me, is, were asked to look at amendments which were outside of their remit. They brought amendments to the Principal Act which was outside of the remit of the committee. If they wanted to have amendments to the Principal Act, the appropriate means to achieve that would be to initiate a bill in their, in, their, in, in their name to address those amendments. So initiate an amendment to the Principal Act, generate a bill, um, sign a bill in your own name, whoever wanted to move it on the opposition side, and table the bill and let it because go Because the opposition has gone public and saying that they find quite a bit wrong with the Principal Bill. So what you're saying is, if that's the case, they should have brought a... Well, well first of all, their party voted in favor of the Principal Act unanimously. You like mentioned said, that earlier on. And, that, and, and, and here I come back to the point that I made earlier. Just a few years ago, their party voted in favor of this act in the Parliament. Um, secondly, you're, you're right. If they had or have a concern about the Principal Act, they could have from 2009 to now, from April last year to now, or indeed now or next week or next month, table a bill to amend the Principal Act. That mechanism, that option is available to them and has been available to them at all times. So they these amendments that. that they have put before you, in fact, are not directly relevant to the bill at all? They're, they're, they're not. But you are still considering them? Well, I'll tell you what, we have, s our proposal to them, I think is an eminently reasonable one. Our proposal to them is, given that we have agreement on the substantive clauses of the bill right. and given the happy coincidence that these substantive clauses happen to be the ones that will also satisfy CFATF, let us, as mandated by the National Assembly, take those substantive clauses, that is the bill, the same bill, the same bill 
back to the parliament, secure enactment and not jeopardize Guyana's international standing. And let us continue a conversation on the amendments to the Principal Act. In fact, the president has gone so far as to say he is willing to consult on the amendments that they've proposed to the Principal Act, including to consult with CFATF to get their comments, because we don't know whether these further amendments that they're pro proposing to the Principal Act, we don't know if they will collide with CFATF and FATF standards. We don't know whether they themselves will result in um, uh, us being um, perceived as undermining or weakening our institutional, um, our leg legislative framework. And so the president has said, and he has himself made his proposal to the leader of the opposition, separate the two issues. Has he put this in writing? He has, in fact, put this in writing. He telephoned the leader of the opposition and wrote him saying that I am giving you an assurance that if we proceed with the bill on which we have agreement, incidentally, mm -hmm. I'm willing to, and I'm committing to you, that I will consult CFATF and other relevant stakeholders, including the private sector, that would have a significant interest in matters like stop and seizure of cash and so on. Um, and then once we get positive feedback on these amendments that you have proposed, that then we, we, will, we will enact those. The president has put that in writing to the, to the leader of the opposition. And those were, were, would be subsequently made to the bill if that, if that situation arose? Or made the subject of a bill in their own right and taken through the parliament, because by then this bill would have been and passed. And what has been the response? Uh, I don't know. I, my latest information is the president hasn't received a written response, but I will say that that doesn't mean that one has not been sent. I am not aware of a written response sent by the leader of the opposition to the president. I will say that I have myself had conversations with the leader of the opposition and others in parliament at which I reiterated this offer, this, it, this um, offer by the president, this proposal by the president. And we, the, the, my understanding of their position is that they remain adamant, that they are not prepared to separate the two sets of issues, and that they will not support the bill returning to parliament, notwithstanding the adverse consequences to Guyana, unless their amendments to the principal act accompany the bill. So the way you've described it so far, it looks very much as though we are in fact going to be reported uh, and, and we are going to be blacklisted at the Paris uh, meeting. Well, they, I will say that there is certainly that very real risk. We now, I don't think, Minister, that a lot of people, especially the average citizen, understands quite what the consequences are going to be well, to the country if this, in fact, now takes place. Well, let me say this, that even before I speak of the consequences, I want to say that we will continue through CFATF and indeed through our engagements with other partners, including our international partners, try to explain the reason why Guyana has not been able to enact this bill. Explain to them the peculiar political situation that our country is but in. But at the end of the day, they're going to hold the government responsible. But that is true. And at the end of the day, it is the entire country that will suffer. The point I was going to make, though, is that we will continue to try to, try to make the case that Guyana should not be punished for the non-enactment of the bill because of capricious opposition action. We will continue to make that case. Were we to be unsuc unsuccessful in making that case, and were FATF to blacklist us or to adversely um, uh, advise the world about our non non enactment of the bill, then you are right that the average citizen perhaps might not um, have contemplated uh, the, the consequences. The what I'm rightly trying to say to you, Minister, is that a lot of this is complex. Yeah. But it has some pretty basic negative effects on every one of us, does it not? Uh, absolutely. In fact, we shouldn't make the mistake to think that it is only about big business. If international financial transactions cannot be executed because correspondent banks overseas sever their relationships with Guyana, or because remittance companies sever their business with Guyana, there are thousands of Guyanese persons who every day or every week receive a modest remittance from their relatives overseas. If a large remittance company decides 
no longer to do business with Guyana because of this negative advisory. That affects people immediately. You can no longer get your money from your relatives overseas. Or it will be more expensive for you to get your money. Or you will face delays in getting your money. Just imagine, I mentioned the questionnaire that was uh, submitted. Imagine now if before a transaction can be executed, you have to fill out a 15-page questionnaire about a, a proof of address and uh, proof of income and all of those sorts of things, audited financial statements before you can execute a financial transaction. So if you're an ordinary family, and, and there are many of them now in Guyana, that uh, depends quite appreciably, especially older people, on these remittances, you may suffer considerable Absolutely. delays. Absolutely. And you won't be able to do anything about it. Absol you, will, you will be completely powerless to do anything about it. You're, you're absolutely correct. But it has also a fundamental potential impact on the economy. If we cannot execute well, international that's transactions, picture, uh, that's the bigger picture. And essentially, investors will become extremely wary and skeptical of doing business with Guyana, which basically means jobs for Guyanese people that will no longer manifest itself. You have investors, I mean, your, your viewers would be very familiar with many, of, whether it's in mining, whether it's in services, whether it's call centers, whatever. These investors operate in an international market. They raise money in international markets. If an investor says, I'm not going to put money in a jurisdiction that is viewed adversely by the international money laundering authorities, then that's jobs for Guyanese people that potentially will be lost or potentially will not be created. That's incomes that will not be generated. In fact, it could substantially uh, cripple the private sector. Absolutely. Absolutely. At a, at a macro level and at an individual, a, business, a company that can no longer send or receive payments from its international company. Especially com companies which are exporting products. Absolutely. Them. Credit card transactions. And also companies, I would imagine, that are dependent on importing a lot of the, the material they use, for instance, the aviation industry. Absolutely. Kit, let me give you a simple example. People don't realize it, but we all have insurance. And every business in Guyana has insurance, and all of that insurance is reinsured. Almost all of that insurance so is reinsured. Go the roof. If you can't get reinsurance, or, pay or, a lot or, more for it. or you have to pay a higher risk premium, mm -hmm. immediately your insurance becomes either tremendously more expensive or completely unavailable. So there seems to be hardly any debate that this could do great harm to the country. I d believe that is now beyond I have doubt. to ask you this question, therefore. Is the opposition, in your view, uh, behaving totally irresponsibly? I, I would say that that would be putting it mildly. I would say to, would you put it? To, to describe their actions as irresponsible, I think, is a mild uh, description. I am myself a mild person, so... Why would they behave like that? Why do you think? I think it's... As a, a member of the government. I think it's partisan politics and political brinkmanship being elevated above national interest. I believe they see this. They know its importance. They know the grave consequences that flow from it. And they see it as an opportunity to extract um, something in exchange for it. And so I believe that it demonstrates a willingness on the part of the opposition to hold the country to ransom in order to extract political advantages. Have you considered uh, doing any bargaining with them? Well, I will say that, I mean, the door is always open. I know the president has been speaking with them. Um, uh, and, and Politics being, being as they are. Well, like I said, I mean, if the, the part of the problem is that this has been a moving target because they themselves have not been consistent in what they have been saying. You would recall that last year the leader of the opposition himself, no less a person than the leader of the opposition, said he sees no nexus between this bill and any other issue. He did say that. He told the private sector that. Well, there you have it. He subsequently said there is a nexus between this bill and some other issues, and that he will not proceed with this bill unless he gets those other issues. He then subsequently said publicly that he, and he is confident, I believe that was what he was quoted as saying, that he's confident that this bill will be passed by the, by the February deadline. And he then subsequently said that he has absolutely no difficulty with the private sector commission attending 
the me and, and, and other stakeholders attending the meeting of the select committee as observers. That commitment was reneged on. And so a large part of the problem is that we haven't been dealing with a clear, explicit, consistent position. It's been a moving target. It's almost like you're standing in quicksand, and as quickly as you move, you're, you, 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 you're sinking. To use the popular phrase, they've been moving the goalposts. It's been shifting goalposts. And I, you know, it's not my place to speculate the reason for these shifting goalposts, but the goalposts have been shifting constantly. Um, there are amendments we referred to earlier on. Have you given any serious thought to those amendments? What's happening with those? This is an amendment that they have proposed, or? Uh, yes, uh, very recently. Well, we've looked at which, them. Which, as you've explained, are directed more to the principal, to the principal act. act. But, the, but nevertheless, they're before sure. you. Well, and, I, and I picked up from the table uh, an advertisement I brought with me. I have no idea where it comes from, but it would suggest it comes from uh, some sort of, of, of government source because it's, uh, it's addressing what the APNU are um, appearing to be proposing, and it's, it's being very critical of it. So I, I wondered if you could give us the facts. Well, I will say, first of all, I have seen the ad too, and you say that it could have come from a government service, you probably are right, but I will say that even outside of the confines of government, there has been expressed national outrage on this matter. Almost every stakeholder that I have spoken to has said, I don't understand well, why the opposition would take a position like this. CARICOM have expressed con The OAS has issued The OAS is Absolutely. Absolutely. The, uh, the, ambassador, the diplomatic the, the, the community diplomatic here, this without true. exception. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, from the USA to Russia. Absolutely. Have, have expressed Absolutely. Uh, very so serious concern. So there has been a very um, consistent chorus of concern at timely passage of this bill, or, or, or the need for timely passage of this bill. Um, you, you ask about the amendments. The amendments that they have proposed are themselves the cause for considerable concern. And just to highlight one of them, but I'm happy to speak about all of them if time permitted. Well, we've got about 14 minutes left. Okay. Well, one of them addresses the empowerment of policemen and customs officers and other persons authorized by the FIU to stop persons anywhere in Guyana and to seize cash on suspicion of money laundering. Now, this is any policeman? This is a policeman above the level of a superintendent or a customs officer above the level of a supervisor or he any person. You can simply come to the conclusion that you have more than, I think, it's, is, is it 10 million? Um, 10,000 10, US ten dollars, US. which would be 2 it million. Two million dollars, sure. Guyana. Uh, and uh, on complete suspicion, if you happen to have it in your possession, seize it. Well, in fact, I should correct myself. It isn't just cash. It's what is described in the act as, in the, well, the act and the bill, amendment bill too. It's what is described as currency. So you could be wearing jewelry. You could be wearing jewelry. Currency is, de is, is defined to include precious metals, um, um, sto precious stones, etc. It has a value. You could be wearing a piece of gold jewelry easily above that threshold, and you could be stopped and that item can be seized on suspicion of money laundering. Now, first of all, this proposal is not the subject of a CFATF amendment. CFATF made no such recommendation. Secondly, anybody who's familiar with Guyana's um, domestic trade and commercial environment would know that we are still a significantly cash-based environment. For various reasons, including the fact that the footprint of our banking industry is not quite yet a national one. There are entire communities in Guyana that do not have a banking presence. I can think, for example... Well, we don't use credit cards the way we use them. We, 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 use use we don't use plastic cards. We don't, we don't have a culture of, of, of uh, uh, checks being used for executing routine transactions only by large corporate entities. And you have entire villages, large expanses of, Guyana, of Guyana's commercial territory without coverage by a bank, a, a bank branch. You take the whole uh, community of Kokwani, there's a single bank branch. You take the northwest of, of, of uh, the northwest district, so there's a single bank branch in, in Port Katu. If you were transferring large amounts of cash from your mining activity to the bank, on the way, that could be seized. That, absolutely. 
If you were a miner coming out from Madhya to go to the bank or to go to the petrol dealer to purchase fuel or or any place else, your cash could be seized, or, your, or indeed your gold. On suspicion. On suspicion. If and you're a rice is, farmer. This is an opposition proposal. This is an opposition proposal. That's before you. Indeed. And the implications, I think, should be evident to all and sundry. I know that this matter has been discussed with the private sector themselves. And I will tell you that the private sector commission has said to me, that they have grave reservations well, about I know implications. That too. And citizens, the man in the street, when they hear of these provisions, they express shock. Kit, it's, you don't have to be a wealthy man to take $2 million to go and buy building materials for your home. Some persons, they will just have their mortgage approved at the bank, their low income mortgage approved at the bank. They will take out of the bank a couple million dollars and they will go and buy their building materials lumber, cement, sand to build their, their small domestic residence. Minister, we've almost run out of time on this very serious issue, and I, 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 I continue to dwell on it because I think it is absolutely critical for the country. Perhaps you can come back, back again. I'd be happy, sir. If you're willing to do that, and, and we could address uh, other very critical issues, such as the budget, which you're about to bring before the National Assembly, sure. and what will happen to that. But I will raise very quickly if I can, the Chief Justice's ruling. Um, uh, I, I pointed out what it was earlier in sure. the program. Uh, the afternoon leader, uh, Brigadier Granger, and I quote him, says, I don't think that the Chief Justice ruling is going to change anything for us. On the other hand, um, the Speaker of, of, of the House, Raphael Trotman, uh, has, uh, has tended to dispute it as well. He has said, the right of the National Assembly to, um, to approve, including the right to amend budgetary estimates, was a long-established right. And then the former Speaker, Ralph Ramkaran, has in effect written a piece, which I'm sure you've read, mm -hmm. uh, which, and I spoke to him before this interview, and I quote him very quickly, the power of the National Assembly to increase or reduce the estimates has remained intact and unchallenged since independence based on what appeared to be clear constitutional provisions. So the speaker and the former speaker are saying, well, this right was there before, and the Chief Justice is wrong now to intervene and take it away. Well, I'll say this. What's your quick reaction? Well, uh, I, I mean, we, uh, one either has respect for the courts or doesn't. And the courts have spoken authoritatively, indeed, at the level of the Chief Justice. The Constitution is crystal clear on this matter. And frankly speaking, I don't believe that you necessarily needed a ruling of the Chief Justice when you really peruse the relevant constitutional articles. But having the benefit of a ruling from the Chief Justice, a preliminary ruling in the first instance, and now this final decision, one simply has to decide, are you going to respect the decision? You can't be selective about dis respecting the decisions of the court. And if you choose to be on the side of, of the law, then you must necessarily respect the rulings and decisions of the court. I will say this, that we are working with a constitution that contemplated a particular state of the world. And that is the constitution by which we must be bound. The reality, and I said this in the first budget that I presented after the 2011 elections, I said in budget 2012 that we are entering previously uncharted territory that will exert a stern test to our constitutional legislative frameworks and that we shall have to apply practical solutions as we confront these. I said that very clearly in 2000, and I cautioned that we are going to encounter situations that we had previously not anticipated or contemplated. Well, the Chief Justice has made a decision. He has made And you're taking your budget to the House based on that decision, and you will behave in accordance with your... We will be guided by the Chief Justice's rule. Exactly. Now, if the opposition isn't guided by it, and they say they're not going to be guided by it, then they will presumably proceed to cut in the estimates. Uh, that 
forces you in the government to demand that they either approve or disapprove the budget. Sure. If they disapprove the whole budget, what then? Well, Kit, and you've got about five minutes well, to Kit, tell me. I'll tell you, that's an eventuality that I hope does not materialize. Um, I will say that it, the, that's also an eventuality that I don't believe is contemplated by the Constitution, the non-approval of a national budget. I think we'll have to confront that if it were to arise. I will say this, though, that there is a lot of, there has been a lot of brandishing of the threat of cutting the budget. Surely a responsible national leader must confront the matter of the budget on its merit. The threat to cut mustn't be one that is brandished simply because one has the power to cut. You cut things because you believe that they merit being cut. And that has not, tragically, that has not been our experience. We have seen the, the uh, brandishing of the proverbial scissors, which, um, as one of my colleagues said, has now been deemed an unconstitutional instrument. <laughs> but um, you saw in the parliament the brandishing, almost literal brandishing of the scissors. And this is unfortunate. And you have, I suppose, two remedies. You have the, the um, legislative and recourse to the court and, and remedies to the court, um, which we have been pursuing. But you also have the court of public opinion. And that's a court in which we're prepared to, we have fought this in the courts of law. And we're quite happy to fight this in the courts of public opinion too. Because first of all, we believe that the budget, this budget, as indeed our predecessor budgets, the predecessor budgets of this government, can withstand scrutiny and every initiative in it is with merit and we have no difficulty laying it bare to be scrutinized by the people at large. And so this selective um, ex, uh, um, um, uh, cutting of the budget, I think is a matter that we are quite happy to put to the test in the court of public opinion as we have done in the courts of Do law. Do I read you to mean the court of public opinion meaning an election? I, it wouldn't be my place to say so, but I will say that the People's Progressive Party Civic is um, is, is, is completely confident about facing the people of Guyana at any time. And that could well be the result if the opposition literally disapproves a complete budget. Well, like I said, Kit, I, I remain an optimist. I believe my president is also an optimist. And I really do hope that that eventuality does not materialize. But if it does, we'll cross that bridge at the You'll time. You'll cross that bridge when you come to we it. We will indeed. Minister, I want to thank you for having um, devoted a lot of time to explaining the situation with the um, money laundering. Uh, it's not yet resolved. Sure. Um, I really hope that you can find the time, perhaps, that we do a more uh, uh, another interview where we can focus more on the budget. Sure. Uh, we haven't had the time. I thought we would get through more quickly, but an hour on television tends to go very quickly sometimes. Um, sure. I'd be very happy to come back at any time you invite me. Great. Well, uh, I look forward to that. Um, would you like to say anything? We've got about two minutes more as to where you now expect we will go with the money laundering. Well, the committee, in fact, meets again today at 6.30. And we will once again reiterate our position and our appeal, reaffirm our appeal that we proceed with the ground that is common, and that is the bill, and reiterate the offer and commitment to address the other matters using the course that we have advised, that, that we have um, laid on the table. Um, I would say, too, in, your, in my, my last minute or two minutes, that um, we ha I will say that the government has been significantly moved and encouraged by the strong public support that has been expressed for our position on this matter. I think, frankly speaking, the opposition's position is indefensible. And I have heard this said by persons who I rega would regard as friends of this government. 
I've heard this said by persons who I would regard as not our greatest fans. I've heard this said by persons that are closely associated with the opposition. In, in fact, many opposition members of parliament say very privately to us that they cannot comprehend the position taken by their party, but they can say this publicly and I suppose whatever disciplinary arrangements they have in place don't permit them to say so. But well, Minister, thank you. I hope uh, for the sake of the country that we remain optimistic, that we, we get beyond these hurdles. No one, I think, listening to this program, no one listening to this program uh, would like to see Guyana's economy severely crippled and severely damaged. Well, and, and, and we hope that you, you, both the government and the opposition, uh, find solutions. Well, Kit, thank you very much. I assure you that the government remains hopeful that we'll be able to overcome this hurdle. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for listening.